Hello everyone, welcome back to Untangling Climate Finance. I'm Jay Tipton and I am stoked to be taking you on another climate finance adventure today. But before I introduce today's guest, I made a promise to read another listener's review and I am a man who keeps his promises. This little ditty comes from Poultry Geist. Poultry Geist, okay. Poultry Geist on Apple Podcasts and it goes something like this. The blend of expert guests in Jay's charismatic approach makes this podcast a go-to for anyone who is interested in the financial side of climate action. The discussions are not only well thought out, but quite engaging as well. Untangling climate finance is a must. Charismatic? Who? Me? No, poultry geist, you're too sweet. Also, that name is fantastic. But let's switch gears. In this episode, I speak with Rick Gilmore, the president and CEO of GIC Group. We discuss his company's new product, the Commodities Plus Carbon, or as he refers to it, CPC. I don't want to give away too much detail and take away from Rick's explanation, but very briefly, CPC is a futures contract that combines agriculture commodities with voluntary carbon markets, which Rick and his team believes will create premiums for growers by merging carbon, in crop prices and individual futures contracts. CPC corn and CPC soybean are their first rollouts of the futures contract, and they're planning to begin eligible transactions in the cash market very soon. But I'm not gonna spill all of the beans, so let's hear from Rick. Hi, Rick, welcome to Untangling Climate Finance. Thank you for joining me. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, and thank you for inviting me. So why don't we just dig right in and tell me a little bit about yourself, where you're from, where you work, anything that seems interesting and and relevant to the work you're doing today. Okay, thanks. I am originally from Minneapolis, Minnesota, but I've been a transplant in the East Coast for a long time. I'm Rick Gilmore, and my company name is GIC Trade, Inc., doing business as GIC Group. And we also have an NGO called Global Food Safety Forum. And my title in for GIC Group is President CEO and Chairman and Founder of Global Food Safety Forum. Lovely. And how long have you been running GIC Group? Do I have to answer that, Jay? <laughs> <laughs> for an eternity, but it's been fun. In, in point of fact, the GIC group is 40, 44 years old. Wow, incredible. That's fantastic. And why don't you just tell me a little bit about GIC group and what you guys do there? Sure. Well, we're an international company and we've done a lot of work with international organizations and the private sector in the, ag- in the agro space, in the agribusiness and agro industry space. And it's been very comprehensive with the diversity of of uh, projects and assignments that you would expect from a comprehensive consultancy. Now, in this phase of GIC, we are focused almost exclusively, aside from the NGO food safety work, on the financial advisory services in the agricultural sector. Mm-hmm. And that includes capital raising, advisory uh, services to different companies and operations, and this new launch that we'll be discussing today for futures contracts. So that is our main focus. I personally am a trustee of a couple of international, well-known international companies, and that is another aspect of the financial service. Excellent. And so, yes, as you just pointed on, we're going to talk about your new program, which is called the Commodities Plus Carbon or the CPC. Is it a program or a project or how should I be referring to it? It's a it's a life commitment, Jay. <laughs> there you go. I like that. We're in the process of launching a series of rollouts in different futures contracts that we'll be discussing today. And that will be under the auspices of a new co, a new company jointly owned by GIC Group, which will manage it as well. And we are now in discussions with a couple of strategic investors 
for their partnership and involvement. Fantastic. And so why don't you just go in and, and tell me about the Commodities Plus Carbon or CPC? What is it exactly? What's the vision here? Well, the vision he is we wanted to develop an alternative to the offset carbon strategy approach, which I, I would define as, and we again, we can get into that later, but the direct payments and then auctioning those carbon credits in the market. This is called an inset strategy. And Jay, when I first started to get into this field and look at it, you know, we were, it was quite some time ago, I'm, I'm afraid to admit. And mm -hmm. at that time, I wanted to do maybe an index that would identify drivers for in the agricultural sector for carbon emissions and have that index on the exchange. But when the Chicago Climate Exchange closed, and when the bill called the Waxman-Markey bill, which was a cap and trade system in the United States, closed, and when the allowances, over allowances in Europe, tanked the carbon prices, the grain merchandising companies closed their trading desks and the volumes plummeted. So as an economist by training, I looked at this and I said, what is carbon credit after all? It's carbon or you might, might say a portion of air, and it has no intrinsic value. What makes it valuable is the regulatory functions mm -hmm. of the carbon markets. So I wanted to give it more value, and that's how we came up with CPC or Commodities Plus Carbon, which combines the spot price value of carbon in the world markets, and we can, and again, we can discuss that more with the crop or product of the futures contract. So our first rollouts are CPC corn and CPC soybean futures contracts. So that means 75% of the futures contract value is the corn price, what's well, called the spot price, and then the 25% is the spot price of the combined values of the compliance and voluntary carbon market. I that mean, was, that's where that gets that gets our listeners any any further along. So if you have questions, please feel free. Yeah, no, that that's perfect. And I do think though that just for the sake of clarity, because we might have some listeners that aren't familiar with a futures contract, maybe it would be helpful if you could actually provide just a very quick overview on what a futures contract is and how that works specifically in agriculture when it's tied to a commodity. Sure. Let me warn you, Jay, I was for a long time an adjunct professor, and I can go on and on about this. So <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I would say a futures contract in simple terms is a classic hedge instrument, which enables the user to lock in a price for the commodity or the product that's the futures contract that it is buying or selling, and that can be bought and sold multiple times as a derivative. The price for these futures contracts are calculated every three months. And in the case of corn, for example, each contract contains 5,000 bushels of corn. So if I'm a grower and I want to be sure before I've sold my harvested corn that I get a price that is attractive to me and I go into the futures market and I take a position to cover the corn I am selling and hopefully lock in a higher price. Now, as you move along, these futures contracts can be sold and resold, as I've said, and then the buyer and seller may not eventually even be in the ag value chain. They may be speculators or brokers. So it's a market distinct unto itself in that case. Right. And so this exact type of scenario can be applied then to carbon. Is that correct? The carbon, uh, keep in mind in the CPC contract, the carbon is integrated a, as part of the futures contract price. So there is no trading 
of carbon credits. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're using what you said was the spot price. So, so for example, at the time that the futures contract is being drafted up, you're making this contract based on the commodity, but then you're also taking the current price of carbon at that moment? Yes. And then we, we track carbon markets at GIC 24-7. And we use a variety of sources. And we don't look just at the EU, which was the big kahuna in carbon credit markets. We look at the Western Carbon Initiative, which is California mm -hmm. and Washington and Idaho and Canada. I think uh, Reggie on the East Coast Canada. as well. So you're 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 looking at the just and the Reggie regulated too, yes. regulated carbon markets. You're not watching the voluntary carbon markets. Oh, definitely, we're looking at the voluntary markets. Okay. You know, we look at the voluntary markets. So we're looking at the trades of the ICE instrument on FITSE. We're looking at Euronext. We're looking at DAX. We're looking at Sydney yeah. as well. Okay. So, yeah. Got no, it. We definitely so definitely look at the voluntary it, markets. Extremely on futures contracts, maybe I should just point out, are each con futures contract in the car voluntary carbon market is 1,000 carbon credits generated from projects that are you know, part of the ecosystem. But like other futures, the two parties agree to trade and underlying, uh, this, in this case, the underlying asset being that credit at a specific date for a specific price. Right, right. Okay, thank you for that. And so can you provide an example scenario of the CPC in practice? I think you said that right now, corn is one of the commodities. So just paint a scenario for the listeners of what a CPC sure. contract I, I looks like. Out, yes, I do have to point out while we are in negotiations at the moment with Chicago Board of Trade for the listing of these first two contracts, they are not listed as yet. We have had a few pilots and focus groups and in one pilot, we did what's called an over-the-counter transaction, which is a cash market. And we have a whole system set up, which maybe when we get to the data collection, we can talk about that. So we have a whole system set up to determine that price of the futures contract. But this works just the way any other futures contract would work in the classic sense. The grower will, the participating grower, or the grower doesn't have to participate, but the grower can, can take a position of that seed. Let's say you're a corn grower. You take a position in the futures market with the CPC corn futures. You can also take a position with just straight corn future. And then he or she's got the price range for the delivered cash crop. The farmer makes delivery of the crop, maybe not the whole harvest, maybe a segmented field, or maybe just a portion of the harvest, either to an independent country elevator or some affiliated buyer, or in the case of grain, very often it's the integrated grain companies that are both buyers and sellers, and sells that delivery cat what's called cash basis. Mm -hmm. The basis is the transportation portion. Now, he or she's got that price locked in on the CPC futures, and there can be a variation at the delivered cash price level. So there's a double hedge, if you will. There's going to be a premium price for sure. Because the farmer gets a premium, the bi the bigger the emission reduction levels, the bigger the premium. Right. But there can be, it's not a perfect match between the futures correlated to that cash delivered price. Right, right. As I was reading through the CPC documents, one of the elements of it that stood out to me was what you guys call good agricultural practices or GAP, because the CPC is incentivizing that. And so can you tell me what constitutes specifically good agricultural practices inside of the CPC? Yes, there's a good agricultural practices are in effect low carbon emissions, sustainable agricultural production practices. And they are 
they cover a range of steps that one can take, such as there's no till. I'm not an agronomist, but I, I think I can describe it, and, and mm-hmm. I think I got it. I think and you got it. No till is very contributory to soil health. It uh, and that's a an increasingly common practice. Another would be crop cover. Crop cover very often before growers left their fields idle with no cover during the non-planting season. This the selection of crop covers can actually provide nutrition to the soil and moisture retention, you might say. Then there's carbon se- carbon sequestration me- measures for the soil. There's lower and targeted applications of nitrogen fertilizer, herbicides, pesticides, etc. All these things which are contributory to a cleaner, healthier environment and also do not take away from yields that right. are that are the uh, so important to the grower's income. Right, absolutely. I guess there's a lot of different terms for what we're referring to as good agriculture practices. I've heard it referred to as like sustainable agriculture, climate smart right. agriculture. So exactly as you said, that these practices, as we've learned through time, are not only good for carbon storage, but also for soil health, yield increase, water retention, et cetera. So that's great. So you guys are incentivizing that which has numerous benefits for the the grower, even if it is something different than maybe what we've learned in terms of agriculture in the, the past generations and decades. And so, That's right. which is good, you know, we got to continue yeah. to learn, right? And improve. And now we know. So as you were developing CPC, what were the challenges and the problems in your brain that you were saying to yourself, okay, I'm trying to address this via the CPC. Like, why is this important now? Well, there's contextually these COP meetings, which are the conferences of parties that are moving towards the implementation of what we refer to as the Paris Agreement, which is how to achieve net zero. That is to say, how we put a lid on the emissions levels, which are so contributory to Mm -hmm. excessive heat, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And certainly there was the contextual issue. There is the question of of the amount of carbon that agriculture, global and U.S., contribute. Just, you know, there's no hard figure on this, but U.S. agriculture admitted in 2020 669.5 million metric tons of carbon dioxide, 50.5% as nitrous oxide, 37.5% as methane, that's supposed to be the killer, and 12.0% as carbon dioxide. This is sourced from the EPA. And, you know, that's that's a lot of emissions. And and then when you get to a global level, you know, the problems are are certainly comparable. So that was a motive, a big motive that we thought that was a way to move agriculture in a win-win situation to benefit growers from a revenue standpoint and the environment from a mission reduction and sustainability standpoint, and also to be, you know, as guardians of, of, our, of the earth as, as contributory to the environment itself under the COP system. And as you said, there are numerous incentives and benefits for the the farmers themselves, which could be higher yields, increased income, and then if done correctly, cost reductions. So there is a lot of incentive for the farmer to get involved, not just from the, the commodity side, but also the potential carbon accumulation side as well. Have you thought much about the benefits that would trickle down or I guess up to the countries or the communities where the CPC is actually being implemented. So if you have a farmer that's, you know, in Idaho that's engaging in the CPC, how does that actually benefit Idaho or the local region or the U.S.? Well, the agriculture acreage counts for uh, accounts for a tremendous amount. Uh, you know, certainly there's the grain belt, but there's also, depending upon the product, just about every state has certain sources of agricultural production. 
So, you know, I think the wider the universe of participation in the CPC, the greater the benefits to even the non-agricultural producing entities nearby. And let's not forget also that there's the there are the indirect benefits. When you talk about sustainable agriculture, you're also talking about the quality of that production. So if there's if there's less herbicide application or pesticide application or you know if it's not a chemical based application, the likelihood that that will enhance the quality of the food itself is significant. So there's the quality of the food. There's the interaction of the entire agricultural value chain food system and the environment that will be benefited, we think, from the CPC program. And I don't think that's an exaggeration. In our case, what's what we're in the process of is is establishing as wide a field of participation as possible because that's critical to listing these futures contracts on the exchange. Mm -hmm. The volume is a determining factor. So the CPC futures that's, that are listed, their impact is going to be wide. Mm -hmm. And that's actually a good transition point into my next question, which is in your brain, who are the targeted futures contracts, purchasers or investors? Who are you going after? Who do you imagine engaging with this from the purchasing side? Well, the purchasing side is is the entire value chain. So when maybe the best way is to give an example of our of a pilot. So when we had our pilot to introduce the CPC, we had, of course, the growers. But then we had what's called futures commission merchants. They're the brokers. Then we had the processors. They can be the ethanol or biofuel processors, but the food processors as well. The retailers, which handle what's called the consumer product. And then the financial houses that finance these transactions. So it's a big value chain and it's very important to our economy. So have you done any modeling or projections on what you anticipate the returns would look like for a purchaser? Well, the returns, let's be clear. The purchaser is purchasing the crop at a premium. Now, that means that purchaser could go out and get cheaper corn, non-CPC corn. However, when that purchaser Let's say that purchaser is also a supplier to a food process. If that purchaser pays that premium, the company can turn around and discount that premium exposure because that will be absorbed by the next phase of the value chain. Why can that premium be passed on? Well, there's thanks to the Inflation Reduction Act, there's there are tax benefits, the 45Q it's called. And we can get into that, or 45Z is another. There's scope three benefits to these purchasers. There's purchasing. There are a lot of informal markets regarding scope three benefits that can be passed along. And bottom line is also we know from data that the high growth markets, given consumer behavior in let us say, wealthier countries, is increasingly environmentally sensitive. So to tap into that higher growth market, the ability to say that this is reduced carbon emission values in the product, in the inputs and in the final product is, is a plus. And, it, and when, you when you calculate the credits and the and the growth uh, opportunities, the premium exposure does not detract from the profitability of the participation. If you're talking about the benefit of the per of CPC from an investment standpoint, we of course have a financial model which calculates what the return is based on turnovers of the futures contracts in the different rollouts. There's another point I, I want to raise, and, 
and please stop me if I get too much in the weeds on this, but Mm -hmm. roughly in the bulk commodities, you could say between 30 and and 45% of product goes to foreign markets. Corn, soybeans, and certainly wheat are likely candidates, for instance. Now, as far as the United States is concerned. So what's just happened in the European market, the second largest buyer consistently of these of these commodities, China being the largest in most cases, but the EU with 27 countries is absolutely huge to and important to us. And then there's other important Asian markets, et cetera. The European Union passed something called CBAM. Have you heard of that, Jay? Yes, definitely. Well, CBAM means cross-border adjustment mechanism, and it's essentially a tariffication system. Right now, the only ag-related item on the list that's passed is fertilizer. Mm -hmm. And that will mean that the importer has to provide the carbon footprint of the fertilizer that's being imported. And if it can't meet the European standard, there's an additional tariff. Well, most analysts, including this fellow talking right now, thinks Mm. that these bulk commodities will be eventually put on the list. And if our growers do not have the ability to pull out a, a carbon emission calculation system, they will be subject to tariffs, and they could be subject to erosion of our market share in those markets. Mm. And that system, by the way, the cross-border adjustment, there are legislative drafts right now in the Congress to be passed here. And you can be sure, in my view, that going that route, China will do the same. So again, you know, we really don't have a choice. For those who want to bury their heads in the sand and say, you know, there's no climate change, that's not the issue. The reality is that there are these systems and tariff structures that are emerging based on carbon emission reductions. And if we don't join the party, we won't be having a very good time. Yeah, that's a very interesting prediction that eventually CBAM might expand to include the commodity itself. I haven't really thought much about that, but that's definitely something that I I think could be very plausible. And I also personally look forward to CBAM's success in terms of what it's trying to do. And I do think because the European market is so large that it likely will have expansive reach beyond just Europe implementing some sort of CBAM. As you said, there is legislation in the US that is talking about this. And I think even prior to CBAM, it was tried a couple times. But I think if CBAM proves to be effective, it will grow. So let's actually talk about the carbon emissions reductions part of it, because that is a a really essential element to not just trading the commodity internationally, but also just in terms of the, the local program itself, if it's being implemented by a single farmer. And so how are you going about tracking and confirming that the emissions are actually being reduced? Yes. Well, there are several methodologies and sources used by our associate firm that has responsibility for collecting the data and for authenticating that data. GIC tracks the carbon markets 24-7, both voluntary and compliance, and we'll be using the continuous emissions monitoring system for the carbon emissions accounting. The methodologies of the authenticating firm include satellite source data, include other carbon tracking sources they tap into. And then they are, in our case, they have to be participants in the protocols that are established by the registries. The registries that will be used by our associate are with the Vera Registry and the SCS Global Registry. So these are major registry firms that set standards for 
at data collection, and that's extremely important. In our case, I like to say that we're building a moat around our data. We have a blockchain specialist on our team. We have mass balance specialists. That's what that is, is a certification system widely used in Europe and now being used here so that when you get a delivery of, say, a bulk commodity like corn, the way it's delivered now, that Johnny has has a hopper car of corn and Sally down the road has her car of corn on the same train and they're commingled. So the mass balance system is a trade accepted system set up by the ISCC that enables the retention of the identity so the buyer knows and can certify that what he or she bought was CPC corn in this case. Mm -hmm. So let me just get this straight, Rick, real quick. By participating in the CPC, carbon credits will be generated. Is that correct or no? No carbon credits. Okay. No carbon credits. Got it. So you will not be using some sort of methodology. Carbon credits, obviously I'm biased, but carbon credits is the old system. It's the offset system. And there are problems, which I can enumerate with that. But what most people would accept is expert view emerging now is that offsets aren't working to get us any closer to net zero. And look, we've had we've had auction systems in the U.S. and longer in Europe, and we're no closer to reducing the increase in heat in the heat. In fact, we're rushing along to a tipping point. There is an increasing interest in the inset version, which is what CPC is. Okay, I understand. What is your standard for permanence? And I ask this because there is, as I'm sure you're very familiar with, I feel like one of the biggest point of contentions with soil carbon specifically is that the permanence element of it, which is how how long the carbon will be stored in the ground if sustainable agriculture practice is implemented, it's not as likely to stay there as like a technological way of removing and storing carbon. And so when I'm learning and reading and having conversations about soil carbon specifically, it seems like this is the one that comes up pretty regularly. And it's simply just because if a farmer decides to implement this practice now, it's not to say that they might not change five or 10 years from now, and then any of the carbon that was being stored doing that particular type of practice might then be released or many other elements or factors that could lead to the soil carbon. And so a lot of talk is about like, what is the number in terms of years that we should say or feel safe with about the permanence of soil carbon. And so I'm just curious what you all are implementing in terms of standard of permanence for the carbon itself in the in the program. Well, you're certainly right that from what I've read too, and again, the caveat to what I have to say is I am not an agronomist. And that's why we have an associate firm to be the data collector and authenticator. However, in our case, Maybe a good example of what we what we used in this pilot, this over the counter pilot, and what we will continue to use as a benchmark is what's called the GREET model, the Argon GREET model that measures a whole range of carbon intensity, many many factors, energy yield factors, fertilizer factors, the energy being on farm on the on farm. There's the organic piece of this, the cover crop, the tillage levels, the soil soil carbon emission retention levels. So they're all here. The point I'm making is that there are so many me- measures and metrics of this carbon intensity that if there is what you might call carbon leakage in terms of the soil sequestration, that is not our only measure. It's a big one. And Certain soils, as I understand it, do better in terms of life cycle analysis models than others. But it it doesn't void the emissions and carbon intensity strategies if if certain soils don't retain that same carbon sequestration level. 
I have another question, I guess, about the data specifically, and I don't know how much of the the data that you're collecting through your various ways of doing so is going to actually make itself to the farmers, if at all, or if they're only really looking at the yields. But in our past work, we've done some agricultural stuff. And I think one of the challenges with a lot of data when it comes to soil is that the farmers themselves just simply either don't have the tools or the time or the expertise to understand and translate certain data. And so there's a lot of like technical assistance that might be necessary, which is either coming through the agronomist or their local yeah, like seed provider or some other sort of assistance. And so will a lot of the data be going to the farmers in terms of, you know, this is what your plot looks like now in terms of carbon or water retention, et cetera? Or is this something that you don't envision sharing with the farmers? Well, the farmers there, I think your question is not CPC relevant. The farmer provides information to data collect. And in our case, we try to streamline that as much as possible to avoid the nuisance factor that growers absolutely abhor in the United States in terms of data collection. They don't interpret the data for us. Mm-hmm. We give what we come up with what their emission level is against the benchmark for net zero. And as I said, we did in this one pilot use the GREET model. And we issue a term sheet for buyers that reflects back what that combined valuation of the carbon and the crop grown on CPC criteria and measured and measurement, what that premium is. The grower can take it or leave it. Okay. And, in the, and in the CPC system, by the way, they don't sign up like in the offset systems that are most prevalent. They don't sign up for five years. They don't have the same liability exposure. They can participate in CPC for an individual load, for a segmented field, or for the entire harvest, of course. But if for something less than that, they can also participate in these other programs. I see. There's no restriction. As we wrap this up, Rick, can you just give me the current status? You've said that there's a pilot underway. So where exactly does the program stand now? And maybe you can elaborate a little bit more on the pilot that you're referring to. We've done a couple of, well, three pilots, really. And they were extremely helpful in popularizing the CPC, which has now gained, frankly, quite a bit of traction. The last pilot we did, we did in collaboration with Bayer Crop Science, and they are the owners of Monsanto, and they have their own data system as well called FieldView Data. They're not financially involved with CPC. I just mentioned that they're, they are the world's largest biotech seed company for the bulk commodities, and so they tap into a lot of growers in the United States and other markets. So We are in negotiation. Obviously, it's sensitive, so I can't name parties or to that extent, but we think the the listing of these first two rollouts is fairly imminent. But then again, you know, whether your glass of wine is half full or half empty. Right. So I'm not ready to commit to that, but it's well known. We have in the focus groups gotten 80% positive response rates from the growers and virtually 100% from financial and the merchandisers. They like this because of its simplicity. It's an immediate reward system. I I would point out this so that I'm not sounding too pie in the sky, and that is that the CPC premiums will not always match or exceed, for that matter, the direct payment systems under the the, uh, offset strategies. What makes us competitive is the following. One, there are no transaction costs to the grower, whereas in these others, the growers have to pay for all those upfront costs, auditing costs and things of that kind. Our revenue comes from the turnover of the futures contract, which we get a shared fee with the listing exchange. The second thing is, uh, with the reduced transaction costs for growers, Their margins 
are higher than they are under these other systems. The other from what we know definitely and what we verified with the barometer survey in Purdue University is that growers being averse to interventions, what they like about CPC is that it's really, really hands off and instant rewards, if you will, and the first adapters are rewarded first. So these are, I think, features that attract growers to the CPC system. Great. That was very comprehensive. So thank you for that. And so, Rick, I always like to close out the episode in two ways. The first is looking towards the future. And you're a young man that's been in this space for a short (laughs) amount of time. Can you repeat that, please? (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. And clearly, you very much have your finger on the pulse of what's going on. So I just want to get your sense not in anything specific, but more generally, of what do you think the future looks like of the intersection between ag and carbon? Yeah, the intersect to me is absolutely clear. And it's a good question. In the absence of carbon reduction measures, which we, and in this discussion, have already equated with sustainable agricultural production and good agricultural practices, the ag value chain will continue to be a driver of global ag emissions. Thereby, it will serve to extend the timeline of reaching the Paris Agreement targets for net zero. More significantly, maybe, is mathematically an absence of reduction measures actually will provide a factorial increase in the level of emissions over time. So these rather significant emission contributions from agriculture and the ag value chain will snowball. And not only will it be harder to produce at the levels and the quality that's needed, but it will exacerbate even further the current condition that we find ourselves in. Mm -hmm. So the last question that I ask is always the same (laughs) because I, I love the school of philosophy, Stoicism, and really appreciate that the Stoic train of thought. And so Epictetus once said, what concerns me is not the way things are, but the way people think things are. And so if we apply this quote to climate finance, I'm curious what you think is one thing that must be done to change the way people think about climate finance. I must say, Jay, I thought we were dealing with hardcore farm issues. I've never, I never expected to be challenged by a Stoic philosopher. But uh, (laughs) here you go, the unexpected. That's it, Rick. (laughs) Expect the unexpected. Yeah, but to me, honestly, it's it's the opportunity cost of failing to reduce carbon to manageable level in the absence of resilience and mitigation strategies. Food systems are defenseless, aren't they? The absence of foresight in incentivizing sustainable ag practices inevitably will result in food scarcities and low quality food production. Scientists vindicated that we're close to the tipping point. So I would conclude CPC as a tool is a low cost risk mitigation strategy. And lastly, better safe than sorry, Jay. Better safe than sorry. Couldn't agree more. Rick, that was a great way to wrap us out. I appreciate it. And I just want to say thank you for taking the time to come on the episode with me and explain CPC. I think it's a really fascinating program that you guys are developing. And I look forward to the development of it. So once again, thank you and have a great rest of your day. Same to you and my pleasure. Thank you again. Right on. That is a wrap on this episode and our climate finance journey into this unique version of a commodity futures contract. As always, I will leave some information in the show notes, like links to Rick's company, to the CPC webpage so you can learn more about that, and a link to their verifier, ucrop.it. And like clockwork, I will be back next month with another episode, so make sure you tune back in. And before you exit out, I encourage you to please take 60 seconds to subscribe and leave a review for us on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. If you listen on Spotify, hit the little bell so you get reminders when new episodes release. Because we record weekly audio versions of our newsletter Sliced, so we are firing off more content than just untangling climate finance. And I promise they'll make interesting listens for your morning or evening commutes, or whenever you listen to podcasts. Anyways, 
If you want to connect, you can shoot me an email at jtipton at gordianotstrategies.com. A link to my email address is in the show notes. Gracias y besitos to everyone for listening. Catch you next time. This podcast is produced by Gordian Knot Strategies.